bite the bullet. Written and narrated by Butterfly Coffee. Adapted for audio by Mr. Jodge. Louise is a small tank engine that lived at Newton Abbott. She is what the railway men call an auto tank. This makes her special, as through unique linkages between her and her coaches, the driver can drive his train from either end without having to turn around. Because of this, she was the passenger engine of the Morton Hampstead branch line, and the importance of this job title had gone straight to her smoke box. As a result, she considered all other work beneath her, and would do anything to put as much distance between herself and a wagon. As with many who were built at Swindon Works, Louise was also very proud of her heritage, holding anything Great Western in high regard particularly her own appearance. She expected her green paint and brass work to be nothing less than spotless. One morning, as the engines were waking up and being fired for work, they overheard the crews talking to one another. They did that a lot now, and it sounded like things were picking up again. So how on earth did they let the jerry slip by then? If there's one thing you can expect the French to be, it's cowards. I heard they went through Belgium instead of going straight for the Maginot line. That's supposed to be impenetrable, isn't it? Why do you think they did a swing through Belgium all over again? You know if they take Paris, they'll take the lot. You be quiet now, Charlie. They can't do that. Lizzie grumbled at them to be quiet. And Louise added to the matter by telling them not to be so worried all the time. It is dreadfully tiresome of you to keep babbling on about this trifle of a war, she said in an exasperated way. It'll all be over soon anyway, and then we can go back to work like nothing happened. That's exactly what they said last time, Lizzie hissed. It'll all be over by Christmas, they said. But that never happened. We went on for quite a bit longer than that and changed a good many people for better or worse. Mind what you say, and you'll have it handed back to you tenfold. The Great Western Mogul quickly left the sheds. She usually did now. She was getting as wound up as the crews themselves, which Louise thought was quite remarkable. As each engine left, Louise sat quietly in the shed, breezily waiting for her turn to be steamed. But that turn never came. Her fire should have been lit hours ago. Her passengers would be waiting. The 1400 began squawking out, demanding to know what in Brunel's name was going on. It was not until mid-morning that Louise heard someone sprinting towards her. Ah, Mr. Turner, sir, she greeted. It's about time I had some information. Please tell me what exactly is going on. Why have I not been steamed up yet? Where is my crew? Mr. Turner spoke after managing to get his breath back. He seemed pressed for time. I apologise, Louise, he huffed. I got preoccupied with phone calls and paperwork. The railways have had word from the British government. All engines in suitable working order are to be repainted at once. And you're going first. Ooh. Louise made a noise. She was very pleased with this. Of course, sir. It is but a pleasure for hard-working engines like me, you know. She watched Mr. Turner hurry back to his office and gave a smug smile. Off he goes, look, like a stabbed rabbit across there. Probably to make some more arrangements for my repaint, she thought. I wonder, what am I to be repainted into? Around an hour later, her escort to the workshed arrived in the shape of 6719. Louise grumbled dreadfully about being towed by an industrial when she could just as easily move under her own power, despite being unable to do so. 6719 stifled a laugh. As timid as he seemed, Louise didn't really frighten him so much as amuse him. It was hilarious to hear her complain about something as trivial as who was taking her to be repainted. 
Newton Abbott was a big enough station that it could warrant having its own marshalling yard, engine shed and locomotive works. It was here that Louise was shunted into place to have her repaint. She was glad to see 6719 puff away. Filthy industrial dares to touch me, how dare he! She growled to herself. But soon simmered down once the men came over. Louise closed her eyes and relaxed as she felt the stroke of the bristles working away at her tanks. She enjoyed being repainted immensely. She was enjoying herself so much, she failed to spot what colour the men had in their paint pots. That evening, the engines came back on shed after another hard day's work. As they began chatting, they noticed a proverbial elephant was not in its room. Where's Louise gone? Caitlin asked. She wasn't in steam today, inquired Duchess. No, Hercule had to manage her passenger duties today. He wasn't happy. You're too right, Hercule grumbled. I've never heard so much fussing and faffing about in my life. Give me dining coaches any day of the week over passengers. Last I saw Miss Nibs, she was at the shed this morning, Lizzie cut in. After a nonsense talk, I couldn't be bothered with her. You aren't the first, muttered Hercule. Actually, I believe I saw Louise being shunted into the work shed, Duchess mused. Oh dear Lord, prepare for the onslaught, Lizzie groaned crossly. She's just going to go on and on and... A horrible noise pierced through the darkening sky, sending roosting birds flying and everyone's eyes popping. It seemed akin to someone being murdered. What's that? Caitlin squeaked in fright. Whatever it is, it's bloody loud, Hercule said, alarmed. And annoying. There was a lot of indignant shouting. No, screeching! like a banshee of the west had come down to reap the souls of sinners. 6719 rolled into the shed's view with an unfamiliar engine in tow. The shape was very much great western, that was for certain. The industrial seemed to be having a very difficult time with... something. Was it trying to keep the engine calm? Or was he desperately trying not to laugh? Well, boil me in brass! Lizzie gawked in disbelief. You wouldn't have caught her scrapped in them colours. No one really answered. With GWR painted on her tanks and coated from buffer to bunker in matte black, Louise was shunted in amongst her shedmates. Then 6719 scampered off behind the wall of the shed. Caitlin thought she heard a lot of laughter coming from there. If no one quite knew what to say last night, they definitely didn't know what to say the next morning. Louise looked righteously cross and was sulking profusely at the back of the shed. No engine would admit it, but they did not want to be the first one to set off the loosest of loose cannons. Sadly, for the residents of shed 83A, the Jinty was the one carrying the burning wick. Louise? Caitlin asked quietly. Uh, are you alright? A very small voice said back to her. Am I alright? Am I alright? Caitlin, you shouldn't have done that, warned Hercule. Am I alright? Oh, Brunel above, now you've gone and done it. Do I look like I am alright to you, Midlander? Louise began screeching again. Those felons have stripped me of my voluptuous green and forced me into this slanderous, disgusting blackboard of a coat of paint. Do you think I am all right about this disaster? You look all right to me. The auto tank made a noise of boiling anger. I have been defiled and I feel vilified. All this is just absolutely disgraceful. I have never felt so humiliated and disturbed by a repaint in all my life! I have a good mind to speak to Mr. Turner about this! What in Brunel's name does he think he is doing with this display? It's outrageous, I tell you! Just outrageous! Nothing was 
gonna stop Louise now. She was well and truly off on one. I want to talk to Mr. Turner immediately. This is just unacceptable. Well, Louise, I'm right here. Is there something you want to say? Caitlin looked back and saw Mr. Turner standing calmly in front of the shed, waiting to address his engines. She thought that laughing behind the wall got louder. Louise rounded on the shed master. Mr. Turner, what is going on here? She screeched. What exactly is the meaning of this ghastly betrayal? Do not speak to me like that, Louise, Mr. Turner corrected sternly. The British government have said that in order to prevent engines being easily spotted from the sky, they must be repainted into wartime black. It's a disgusting colour, Louise rapped. I want to be repainted immediately. I refuse to work looking like this. I'm afraid you have no choice in the matter, Louise. Stop your complaining and get to work, please. I shall not. Louise. Mr. Turner's voice suddenly dropped. The air grew thick and silent. Even the laughing behind the wall stopped. Everyone watched and waited with bated breath. Is everyone to be repainted like this? Yes, every engine that isn't already black will soon be. The Midlander and the Industrial shan't be blackboarded. They have no need to be, whereas the rest of you do. That is a gross manipulation of circumstance! Louise shrieked. Her face was very, very red. Fine then, let those other miscreants have it. I am an engine of high calibre and I shall have no part of this mess, I tell you. None of it! You will do as you are told, Louise. I will not! Mr. Turner suddenly stood very straight. He and Louise looked each other hard in the eye neither one seeming to back down. Caitlin was very frightened by all the shouting, and she began trembling so much her side rods were beginning to rattle. Everyone watched as their shed master breathed in deeply and put the palms of his hands together, breathing out in a long, steady manner. Okay then. His voice was barely above a whisper. Everyone to work as usual, please. I shall have to make some arrangements in the meantime. And Mr. Turner strode away. After a long moment, Lizzie was the only one to speak. I hope you're proud of yourself. For the longest time, no one came near Louise. No crews were assigned to her, none of her passengers asked after her, and no engine approached her. The row that morning had made everyone put their noses to the grindstone to make up for one engine down. No one knew what Mr. Turner was going to do, but Louise had been the first to cross him since he became the shed master. So whatever was going to happen, it would not be pretty, nor forgotten in a hurry. Louise thought she was justified. She had made her upset clear, and arrangements were going to be made. All that shouting was a little over the top, but nothing was gained by being meek as far as she was concerned. All she had to do was sit and wait to see what the outcome would be, although she did wonder why some engines were shooting her dirty looks. The afternoon came by before Louise heard someone stop next to her. She gave a satisfied smile. Wasn't that a splendid display? She asked. Hercule did not reply at once. You've been bloody stupid, Louise, he said. Well, I don't see how that could be possible, Louise replied. I've simply used my wit and guile to get what I want. Mr. Turner did say he was making arrangements, didn't he? I shall soon be repainted and back to work on my line. You wait and see. No, Louise, no, Hercule whispered. No, you can't be that thick. 
That's not what happens to engines who refuse to steam. <laughs> Hercule, please. Louise giggled. You're getting hysterical over absolutely nothing. Hercule gawked at her. He didn't know what on earth to say. I'm getting hysterical? He parroted. Louise, do you have any idea what might happen to you if you just get your stupid, self-absorbed funnel out the clouds for one second? Don't speak to me like that, Louise snapped. They'll take you off the roster and put you on the scrap line. Hercule let off steam in frustration. Don't think they won't. I've seen it happen in the coal fields. If they can do it to industrials, they can do it to you. Poppycock, Louise responded. I'm far too valuable to be put on the scrap line like a common engine. Besides, I am in excellent working order. To toss me aside would be counterproductive. Louise! Hercule was quickly losing all patience. I'm warning you, don't you go around thinking you can't be touched just because you have a fancy train and branch line to yourself. That won't stop him doing it. Pop! Louise snorted. Don't you in the Midlander have some trucks to arrange or something of the sort? All right then. If you can't listen to me, and you can't listen to Mr. Turner, I look forward to seeing you being dragged off and all. And with those words, Hercule puffed away. Louise sniffed and settled down from a doze. As Caitlin was shunting the last coach back into its place, she saw Mr. Turner step out onto the platform to oversee the last few operations before cocking off. Are you alright, Caitlin? he asked. Caitlin struggled to speak. She'd been spending all day trying not to think about that morning's row in case she started crying. The poor engine stammered like a broken phonograph. What's going to happen to... To Louise, sir, she managed at last. Mr. Turner heaved a sigh and dug his hands deep in his pockets. <sighs> Louise has been a difficult engine to work with for the longest time, and this morning was the final straw for my letting her get away with her behaviour. Are you sure you want to hear what I have planned? I will warn you, it is not for the faint of heart. Caitlin listened carefully, and indeed she was horrified. She was so startled by what was being said that she didn't see Hercule moving Louise, who was fast asleep, onto a siding alongside the locomotive works, where one or two engines sat in disrepair. Louise had been moved to the out-of-use line.